so much, Janet. Um, so the title of our event today is Incendiarism in Waterford, and it's actually taken from a report in the Freeman's Journal in 1923. So at this point in Waterford, in, in late May in 1923, um, that wasn't um, a euphemism. There was lots of fires, um, there was lots of violence, and so the question was, how was the new free state going to respond to that? And our next um, speaker, Dr. Pat McCarthy, is going to address that very issue. So Pat is a native of Waterford City, and I'm obliged by Pat to mention a past pupil of Mount Sion. Just wants to make that clear. Um, he holds a PhD and an MBA from UCD. He's the author of The Irish Revolution, 1912-23, Waterford and the 1916 Rising, The Redmonds and Waterford, a Political Dynasty, 1881-1952, um, Waterford City, the East Waterford Brigade, IRA, and the Struggle for Independence, 1912-1921. And he's published extensively in the Irish Sword, DC Journal, and other um, journals. So the title of Pat's talk is Use No Half Measures, Make an Example of the Place, The National Army and the Farm Labour Strike, 1923. Um, thanks, Joanne, for that. I should emphasise, by the way, that that PhD was actually in chemistry. I'm not a historian. <laughs> I'm a lapsed chemist and spent my life working in the pharmaceutical manufacturing industry but I've always had a fascination with history. Now, if, before I start, I would like to echo what Emmett said in thanking the committee for having this event. And I have to say, I think the committee, the chairman, Bernadette and Joanne have done a wonderful, wonderful job throughout this decade in the width and breadth and diversity of the events they've organized. Every county has done the War of Independence, the Civil War, the armed struggle. But I can't think of anywhere else that has had seminars on John Redmond, who was MP for Waterford, not Wexford, on Cahill Brewer, Republican side, on the Labour side. And on that diversity, I have to say, they deserve a huge thank from all of us on that, in addressing the whole broad issue. Now, use your own discretion. Use no half measures. Make an example of the place. That's the text of a wireless message from Colonel Patrick um, Dalton, who was OC of a unit called the Special Infantry Corps, to one of its commanders. Now that's the kind of language you'd expect before a battle or an attack. You might have expected it during phases of the Civil War. The battle at Kilmallock, the most intense fighting, or the advance on Cork, the amphibious assault on Cork. But it's not. That's in June 1923, when the Civil War had actually ceased. He's actually talking about the strike in Waterford. And by the way, Dalton was a Waterford man. He was from that vanished village called Sally Park in Waterford. Some of us are old to remember when people used to live there. But, and also Hedrington was a Waterford man. So they were both familiar with the situation. So I want to, in a way, sketch some of the background to supplement what Emmett has done. Now, labour, as Emmett has pointed out, grew tremendously in those years. And there's a set of tree maps showing the branches of the Irish Transport Union. And you can see how in 1916, there was only one branch in Waterford, and that was in the city. By 1917, it's not in the official records, it's not paying its dues. But by 1918, you can see the beginning of this massive spread on a parish basis into the farm labourers, into the rural labourers. And Emma sketched out the number of them, the conditions, etc. There is a wonderful quotation on in the RIC, the constabulary, the county inspector every month sent in a report to headquarters. 
His September 1917 report has the phrase, the farmers have done well out of the war, but they are reluctant to share their newfound wealth with their laborers. Surprise, surprise. But that changed as the union became more established and more militant. And to quote Emmett, by 1921, the workers had created a powerful labor movement in Waterford, syndicalist in structure, socialist in ideology. And as well as that, John Butler, from here in Dungarvan, who became a TD for Labour, said in April 1922, when there was a general strike against the drift towards civil war, that the strike showed the power of, the, of free labour to do anything it wished. Labour is opposed to free staters, republicans and unionists alike. We are out for a workers' commonwealth. There was a degree of confidence in Labour in Waterford that they could achieve anything that they wanted. Now, the 1920 agreement, the 38 shillings a week, had become sacred. That was a living wage. At last, the rural labourers had achieved a, a living wage. And having finally achieved it, they were not going to let it go easy. Sir John Keane started his political life as a young man, dedicated unionist in the 1890s. But by the 1900s, he had become convinced that the least worst option was home rule. He was very active in agricultural issues. He was looked upon as a very prominent agriculturalist, developing prize heard on his estate in Capricorn, etc. He had a distinguished service in the First World War in the British artillery, returned and began to take a, a lead in both U, the Irish Unionist Alliance and in agricultural issues. On the agricultural side, he gave an interview in the Farmer's Journal in uh, 1920. And if you look at what he said, farmers should re refuse to negotiate with union officials as a matter of policy. The Irish Farmers Union should have a strike-breaking capacity, a farmers' freedom force. They were his views. He saw no role for the union in dealing with his, with his labourers, and he felt all farmers should do the same. Now, as Emmett has mentioned, 1922, you had a strike. This was the beginning of a concerted move to reduce the wages from 38 shillings a week for a 45-hour week to 30 shillings for a 54-hour week. Now, in that strike, which began on the 22nd of May, Waterford, East Waterford, Mid Waterford, the heartland of the Union, they were ready. And as soon as the strike started, they took control of all transport within the county, blockading the roads. Nobody could enter anywhere without a pass from the Union. You there could be no delivery to a farmer unless the farmer had signed up to the 38 shillings. And that was very successful. And you can see there the various claims in the um, Voice of Labour, how the Voice of Labour, you know, moved, reported that the strike progressed. Warford will win. First stages of farm settlement, of farm fight, are heartening. Dungarvan already settled. On the 3rd of June, Warford winning all the way. Farmers flogged in five day fight. 60% surrender already. 
That was part of their tactic. Pick off individual farmers, get them to sign up to the 38 shillings, and then go to the next farm and say, your friend and neighbour has signed up. So, and then, by the 17th of June, 90% settled. But that was in East and West, sorry, East and Mid Waterford. In West Waterford, the big estates were much better organised to resist. And as part of the tactics, they began to, the strikers began to blockade some of the big estates. In her unpublished memoir, Emily Usher describes, in her words, how a train load of roughs, quote unquote, roughs, came in from Waterford, alighted at Kappa Station beside their estate, and blockaded the um, house, blockaded it for six weeks, during which they had to try and smuggle in food. And their night times were interrupted by singing of red songs, etc., etc., etc. But they held out. And of course, with the outbreak of fighting in the Civil War, that really switched the attention. So the big estate winners won in West Waterford, the trade union, the labourers won in East Waterford. And at the end of it, in August 1922, the voice of labour summed it up, decided, and it had a go at Sir John Keane, saying that in his estate, the labourers, despite the instructions of the union, had accepted the 30 shillings, but 90% of their members had actually achieved the 38 shillings. And look at the last words. The end is not yet, Sir John. He never said it through a word. The end is not yet. The end would come the following year. Now, if we look at the next, what, what did each side learn? From the point of view of the laborers, a short strike. They could win a short strike. Financially, they could not carry a long strike. Control transport. If you control transport, nothing could move in or out of a farm. Control the roads, blockade the roads. Use of violence. Use of violence in two things. To assist the blockade and to make sure your members stayed solid. And get sympathetic action from the other unions. They were necessary if you're going to win a strike. The farmers learned their lessons as well. All farmers must unite. More meet violence with violence. Build a fighting fund and get government support. Government support was deemed to be essential. And Sir John spent a lot of time in the autumn and winter of 22-23, building that support, making sure that the membership of the Irish Farmers Union in Waterford expanded and that they built up a fighting fund so that they could support their members. At this stage, as Emmett has outlined, James Baird arrived, the rotten prod, tremendous socialist, totally committed to workers but totally believing in what would have been termed extreme measures, if necessary. So, to the, to the surprise of many, negotiations actually started at the beginning of May 1923, but they didn't last long, and they broke down. And the final offer was to be 30 shillings a week, no bonuses, and the bonus, particularly the harvest bonus, was a week's wages and was hugely important to the labourers. And as Sir John Keane himself said, we admit it is not a generous wage, but it is as much as the industry can stand. Baird was under pressure from Liberty Hall to accept some compromise 
But he pointed out that 90% of his members were for a strike. No reduction, no compromise. And he was convinced that with the same tactics, he could win it in two weeks. So it began. And the Labourers had a couple of very early victories. The next slide. Yeah. You know, on to the next one anyway. Kilmeaton Creamery. On the 18th of May, two days after the start of the strike, a convoy of carts left Kilmeaton Creamery to bring butter, boxes of butter, to the docks in Waterford for export to England. Next slide. And a ship, the name will be familiar to many people in Waterford, the Great Western, that variation of it, was waiting at the docks for the shipment. The convoy was escorted by the military. When they got as far as the dock, which was beside the Tower Hotel, there was a very large crowd of trade unionists, both the rural labourers and their supporters. They, guards supported by the army with fixed bayonets, forced their way through the crowd, who did not actively resist. They pushed them to one side. The dockers refused to handle the butter. So the farmers themselves unloaded the butter from the carts and brought it on board the ship and stored it in the hold in the ship. And that was fine. But the sailors on the ship refused to sail the ship as long as the butter was on board. Conscious that time and tide, and particularly the tide, waits for no man. The captain asked the crew would they unload the butter and they were very happy to unload the butter, some of which apparently was unloaded into the river. So it had to be, it had to be brought back. A few days, first victory if you like, to the strikers. Next slide. A week, about a week later there was another major confrontation. A convoy of farmers with their carts approached what was the grain store on Hanover Street to load feed for their animals, again escorted by the army, with the guards helping in the city. That they forced their way through. The workers in halls to Granary refused to load the carts. They were all promptly dismissed. The farmers loaded the carts and again escorted by the army began to make their way back towards Kilmac Thomas. At Ballyduff Glen, they came under sustained gunfire from the hills surrounding Ballyduff Glen. There was an exchange of fire for about 20 minutes. One soldier was wounded, and when the firing ceased, they brought the grain back. But that's a kind of level of violence where you're getting gunfire, guns being used, and you're getting the sympathetic action. It's the kind of thing that worked, if you like, in 1922, but not necessarily 1923. In reply, next slide, the Secretary of the Warford Farmers Association wrote to the minister, my committee have had difficulty in restraining the young impulsive members of the Farmers' Union from committing serious reprisals on the strikers. As they point out, the strikers are boasting that the government will not punish them. And it goes on, and it more or less says, if you don't sort this out, we will. We will take the law into our own hands. Now, another concern for the government was they strong, they were paranoid about this. They strongly suspected that the next slide that the anti-treaty, um, the irregulars as they were called, were supporting the strikers with gunfire. Now there is no evidence whatsoever that the anti-treaty IRA, who were in literally disarray after the end of the Civil War, were actively supporting the strike. Individuals who, as 
that report says were drawn from the same class as the strikers were probably helping them. But, they were, but the government was convinced that this was part of the anti-treaty campaign. Next slide. Now I want to go back a bit. In November 1922, Kevin O'Higgins was convinced that the Civil War had been won. They had cleared the irregulars out of every town, every city and town in the country. But they were very active in the countryside. And he prepared a memo for a government and he pointed out the police force, no police force was functioning through the country. No system of justice was operating. The wheels of, just, of administration lying idle. And then he goes on, and this was typical O'Higgins, anti-treaty support was not Republican idealism, but greed, envy, lust, drunkenness, and irresponsibility. The irregular campaign depended on the support of people in possession of land and property, not legally theirs. People who owe money or are engaged in illegal activities such as patine making. So he was saying all this trouble in the countryside was not politically motivated. He's saying it's agrarian unrest. And his solution was the army must act as armed police as well as military. He wanted army intervention in support of the farmers against any agrarian unrest. And he got huge support from Paddy Hogan on it. And in a subsequent debate, O'Higgins said, the army, the armed servants of the government have a mandate to restore order. It is right that we should use these armed servants in the way we think best, calculated to restore in the shortest possible space. The bonds of religion and human respect have broken down and people are running amok in riot and plunder. We cannot hold and build up a disciplined and self-respecting country without hitting pretty hard a head here and there to encourage the rest. That was his view, and he is strongly supported by the Minister for Agriculture and by other ministers. One minister that did not support him was, Mick, was Dick Mulcahy, Minister for Defence. Mulcahy argued that if they were to use the army like that, you were going back to the use of the British army in the land war, supporting evictions, supporting seizures, etc., etc. And he said the most important thing is to establish the army as the national army, the army of the people, to get respect from the people, to get the support of the people. And if you start using them like this, you're in danger of losing that support. But he was overruled. And as a compromise, they set up this unit called the Special Infantry Corps. Yep. On that, local officers and men would not carry out these duties. This would be a special unit headquartered in the Cora, which would send down men to carry out the nasty business, if you like. What O'Higgins called the rough and ready duties that are necessary. And that unit grew. As I said earlier, the OC was Patrick Dalton. Initially, they thought there'd be a thousand men in the unit. By the time it was finished, there was over 4,000 in it, organizing battalions. Now, their duties, they were ordered not to engage with Republicans, not to engage with armed irregulars. That was for the Norman army. Their primary duty was to enforce law and order in rural areas, combat land grabbing, cattle driving, unlawful gra grazing, strikes, etc., enforce court orders. So John Keane had got his strike breaking capacity. Next slide. On the 1st of June, 
the first of two battalions arrived in Waterford. Two battalions were sent there, the 6th and the 11th. And you're talking about up to 800 men between the two of them. One battalion was stationed headquartered in Kilmac, and that had small groups dispersed around the country. In every parish, you would have had a post. As the correspondent of the Manchester Guardian said, there are posts everywhere that the Warford Farmers Association decides they should be. So they were calling the shots on where these men were deployed. Also, the farmers began to import feed directly onto Dunabratton, to Dungarvan, where the Union, a small port, small number of members, they could be intimidated away from the port. And they began to, to fight guards for the big farmers, resident guards for them. And above all, from the 1st of July, they imposed a curfew. I'll come to that now in a moment. But, next slide. So the full text of that wireless message was, see guard superintendent re-labour troubles Kilmeaden district. Commandant Paul, who was command of the regular army in Waterford, will be instructed to loan you necessary transport. Clean up this area at once. Use your own discretion, react action to be taken. Use no half measures. Make an example of the place. Wireless be at once if transport is not supplied. And thanks to Edmund Keown and to Poole, we have some wonderful images. Trashing in East Waterford under Army Guard. And as you can guess, that's been a colorized photograph. Couldn't resist it. You have the unloading of the ships in Dungarvan. And next slide. In that one, you may notice that the young boys watching beside the soldiers, some of them are barefoot. I wonder, was that the fine weather or the poverty? Who knows? But they had an immediate impact. This was meeting violence with violence. Next. The, um, if we look, next one, there. That gives you an idea of the distribution of the posts throughout East Waterford. In every parish, there was a permanent military post. Next slide. Every week, each post sent in a report. And I just read one from the Tremor post. Roads were constantly patrolled. On the night of the 6th, Hay, the property of John Halley, Grown, was burned. Sergeant Callahan, in charge of patrol, arrested four boys on the main road. They were released. On the night of the 5th, Michael Peart, James Fenley and James Summers were arrested by Sergeant Callan for a breach of curfew regulations. A shot had to be fired over their heads before they halted. After investigation, they were fined five shillings each. They were lucky. They were fined five shillings. The normal fine was about 10 shillings. And you could be detained without any charge simply internment in a temporary internment camp that they had erected, just barbed wire and tents, in the grounds of the courthouse in Warford City. The normal fine that was imposed on curfew-breaking labourers was 10 shillings, plus a week or two in the prison camp. 10 shillings was most of the strike pay for a week. That's how severe that was. And I went through the record for the month of July, and in the month of July, um, 63 strikers were arrested for breaking the curfew, fined and detained, fined or detained, or both. Three guys who were detained in early July were not released until mid-September. So this was indefinite detention, without charge, military law. Only one farmer broke the curfew. Now I'm not suggesting that the farmers were 
a law-abiding citizens who have kept the curfew. And we will come soon to examples of where they didn't keep the curfew. But that was very, very savage crackdown on them. Next slide. We then had the election in August 1923. And whereas in most of the country and in Warford, this was primarily a republic versus free state election. And a lot of emphasis in Warford was on the performance of Kathleen Brewer, Cotta Brewer's widow, who topped the poll. But, as was reported, the general election in Warford takes place under the shadow of intense class conflict. And that's probably unique in Irish elections, that there's the emphasis on the class conflict. Nicholas Wall, the farmer's candidate, kept repeating, it's our money they want this year. It'll be our land next year. And as Emmett said, Baird countered that. He consistently said, the only right that the farmers have to the land is the right of conquest, the right of Cromwell, and of the acts of British Parliament. And then he would produce the box of matches as the weapon of choice. I always wonder about this election poster. Did anybody ever actually read a poster with so much on it? I have my doubts. But if you look at the headings there, it's all about the Bolshevist doctrine and the attempt to steal the land. That was the farmer's message consistently. The election, one Labour candidate won, the other, sorry, one farmer's candidate won. So once James Baird contested the election, he did best in terms of first count of the two Labour candidates but he wasn't transfer friendly, uh, transfer friendly. So John Butler um, got elected. Baird was immediately afterwards, after the election, arrested, and initially arrested by the guards, and charged with encouraging incendiarism. He was transferred almost immediately to military custody, where there was no need for charges or court appearances or anything like that. And after a week in the POW camp, if you like, in the Warford courthouse, he was transferred to Kilkenny prison, where uh, again the army were in charge. After a couple of weeks there, he went on hunger strike and was on hunger strike for three weeks. His health was deteriorating significantly and rapidly and while Cathy orders his release. He was released, taken to hospital, and O'Higgins responded with a very sharp memo in writing to Mulcahy. And I quote, it is difficult to understand the release of Baird without any previous consultation. Baird, as you know, is an agitator of the most extreme type. And in the course of the war for strike, carried out under his own direction, there have been 70 to 80 cases of arson. Now most of that was burning of herrings. Next slide. But the laborers had got desperate at this stage. They knew they were not winning. So they had resorted to burning herrings. And a farmer's guard what they call a white guard was formed. Now just read the next couple of slides, that one, this one here. <coughs> Pat Murray, Smoor Dunhill, Irish Transport and General Workers Union shop steward, was warned by Pat Cleaney, union official, that there were rumours around that the farmers were going to get him. It came at 2 a.m. on the 10th of September, when the door of his cottage was smashed down and he and his brother and sister were ordered out and shots fired over their head. Petrol was then poured over their furniture and set on fire. When the premises were well alight, the four men drove away in a motor car, passing a military patrol which did not stop them, even though they were technically breaking the curfew. When the report of the arson 
I know a number of deeds, or seven of them all together, that week reached Dalton in the weekly reports. He recorded, regrettable, but the best method to stop the burnings by the labour crowd. However, the Garda superintendent in Waterford City, in his report, he said, there was strong suspicion that the Special Infantry Corps was directly involved in the burning of cottages. The local newspaper, the Waterford News, spoke about a weekend of frightfulness, burnings and shootings near Waterford. Between the hours of 3 and 5 a.m. on Saturday morning, the cottages of Messrs. Dalton, Secretary Baddy Duff, Murray, Secretary Dunhill, Carey Holy Cross, and O'Shea Butlerstown were likewise visited by masked and armed men in motors. The occupants were ordered out and the subsequent procedures adopted appears to have been the same. Furniture and bedding were piled together in the centre of a room and sprinkled with petrol and set alight. The incendiaries quickly departed. Patrick Heaney, Secretary of Butlerstown Transport Workers, was stopped on his way home a few nights later. He was robbed of four pounds ten shillings, which was probably the strike pay that he was distributing, and severely beaten with the butts of revolvers. Now, it was quite clear to, to everybody that the workers were losing. Some of them began to drift back, and the workers tried, the union, the militant guys, tried to intimidate them back. There was one reported incident of three workers going back to work on a farm near Bally Gunner. They were attacked by six strikers armed with sticks. One of those being attacked through a pistol in self-defense fired at the six, wounding one of them in the hand. The six strikers were arrested and spent time in the internment camp in the courthouse. The guy who fired the shot, he was self-defense and he was acquitted of anything. But at this stage, it really is, the strike is running down. One or two farmers who settled were again intimidated into reneging the settlement. When, at the, next slide, at the suggestion of W.T. Cosgrave, there was an attempt to arbitrate, Sir John Keane said, no, we're not prepared to talk with the union. Any individual labourer can approach his employer and if the employer needs him, he'll take him back when he wants him, on his terms. But we will not talk to the union. And the view from Liberty Hall, next slide. Just look at the figures. In this period, bearing in mind there were still some workers in other industries working, there was return to remit at the head office. £1,295 received from head office for strike pay. 17348 That's the balance. You could not, the union was being bled. And according to William O'Brien, it looked as if it was going to wreck the whole union. And we had a consultation with the executive about it. And they said it was all over now. And we would have to end it. We decided to stop it on a certain date. So himself and Thomas Foran came down on the 8th of December, had a meeting, and told the union representatives in Waterford that they were stopping the strike pay with immediate effect. <laughs> James Baird argued strongly, looking for a general strike. He said when we were in the same situation in Belfast with the Boiler Makers Union, we mortgaged the union premises to support our members. But the Irish Transport said no. So that was the end of the strike. They were told, they tried to put a brave face on it. In order to save the organization locally, it was decided that all should return to work forthwith and await a favor opportunity to recover lost ground. There was no overall return to work. It was up to each farmer to decide when and who would come back 
at the 30 shillings a week. And it's estimated that less than half got their jobs back. Slide, next slide. It was summed up in January 1924 by Liam Curran at the Waterford Workers' Council. They were told that the day that the Free State Treaty was signed, that they had obtained the greatest Magna Carta the world had ever seen. Well, now, they, the workers, had no work and they could lie out in the fields or stand on the quay and look up at the flag on Reginald's say, tower and say, now we are free. Free to go home and starve with our wives and children. That was the end of it. That was the outcome. Next slide. As regards the Special Infantry Corps, it was disbanded in December 1923. Its job was done. Three months later, Kevin O'Higgins at an army inquiry said, it, the Special Infantry Corps, performed this task well, establishes a memorandum of the Minister for Agriculture myself. It did rough and ready work in stamping out agrarian anarchy and other serious abuses. The workers in war had a different memory. Now I can quote from an interview that Emmett did with a worker 50 years later, Tommy Skelton, talking about the Special Infantry Corps. They were recruited from the scum of Ireland. They did an awful lot of drinking. Most of them were tinkers. They patrolled the roads after 10 o'clock. Anybody caught out after that was held in their camp at the courthouse for a week or two. And that was the memory that they left. But, next slide, to sum up, I think Frank Edwards, who would need no introduction to anybody here, I'm sure, hit the nail on the head when he said, he was asked about the Civil War, and bear in mind Frank Edwards' brother had been shot in very disputed circumstances while a prisoner in Kilkenny Prison. His memory of the Civil War was, there was another outgrading outbreak after the Civil War had ended. It was a localised Civil War, but maybe a more logical one. And that's why I always think that Warford had two Civil Wars. The second was the Labourers' dispute. And like the other one, it left long and bitter memories and had a huge impact on the people of Waterford. Thanks.